Last week after our test, we started our new unit on uniform circular motion. We first defined uniform circular motion as motion in which the object is going around in a circle at a constant speed. That's important for us, that it's going around at a constant speed. Not a constant velocity, but a constant speed. The direction is changing, but the magnitude of the velocity or the speed isn't changing. First, we define two new terms, frequency and period. The frequency of an object undergoing uniform circular motion or any other motion, if we can use the term frequency with it, is defined as the number of cycles per unit time, or the number of cycles usually per second. Now, in the context of circular motion, one cycle would be a revolution. So when we talk about the number of cycles per unit time, it would be the number of revolutions per unit time. We could write that as an equation as, by, as saying f is equal to the number of cycles or the number of revolutions divided by the time. The units for that would be what? Two sets of units that we can use. One is, comes straight from the equation. The other one is a kind of a derived unit. Yep, Dom? Hertz is the derived unit. The one that comes from the equation is cycles per second. Okay, we're going to write down Hertz because that's the most common thing that we see there. Period. It's the exact opposite of frequency. If frequency is the number of cycles per unit time, then the period would be the time per cycle, or in the context of circular motion, the time per revolution. Given by the symbol big T. Okay, little t is time, and it could, in fact, even be the time for one cycle. But little t can be any time you want. It's a general time. The time for one cycle, it could be the time that it takes you to drive your car to Calgary. Big T is the time specifically for one cycle, or in this case, one revolution. So we're going to say big T is the period. It's going to be the total time divided by the number of cycles. Again, it's the exact inverse of the frequency. What's the units that we use for period? What's the units that we use for any amount of time? whether it's the time for one cycle or the time that it takes you to drive your car to Calgary. Yep. Se seconds, right. Now, you could write it as seconds per cycle or seconds per revolution, but it's okay just to write seconds there as well. There's an equation that relates these two together. These two, by the way, don't appear on our data sheet. The one that relates the two together does appear on our data sheet. And what is that equation? How do you write period in terms of the frequency? Olivia, I know your hand's not up there, but it was kind of up in the air there, not intentionally, but I'm going to call on you anyways, because it's what happens when you kind of only put your hand halfway up. Yeah, it's good. It's 1 over f. Now, if you want to solve for frequency, of course, it's going to be 1 over t. This is the way that it appears on your data sheet, though. Okay, one more equation, one more term, and one more equation that goes with it. Speed, okay, it's pretty self-explanatory what that means. How fast is the object that's going in a circle moving? Right? Not direction, not velocity, but how fast is it moving? Now, the equation that describes a constant velocity, and that's what we're dealing with here, right? A constant speed. The equation that describes a constant speed of an object undergoing uniform circular motion is d over t. But can anybody tell me what the distance around the circle is? The distance around the circle once. What's that called? Starts with a C. Circumference. And what's the equation for circumference? There's two of them that we could give. They both mean the same thing, but slightly different form. 2 pi r. It's on our data sheet, right? Speed is equal to 2 pi r, the circumference divided by, well, if we're using the distance around the circle once, then we've got to use the time around the circle once. Merrick, what's the time around the circle once defined as? Anyone else? Anyone want to help him out there? Yeah, Hugh? The period. So we're going to say, well, speed is d over t, but speed is also the circumference divided by the period 2 pi r over t. The ones that are squared off in red are the ones that appear on our data sheet. All of these equations, including the ones that are squared off in green, we have to be familiar with. All right? We talked on Wednesday, in addition to this, we talked about... Uh, centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. 
Centripetal means center seeking. The centripetal acceleration is the acceleration of an object undergoing uniform circular motion that points toward the center of the circle. And centripetal force is the force that points toward the center of the circle. Now, some of you were puzzled by this on Wednesday or Thursday, whatever day it was that we went over this. If you swing the keys around my head, how can there be an acceleration when it's undergoing constant speed? Well, the direction is changing. How can it be toward the center of the circle? It's never moving toward the center of the circle. How can the acceleration be toward the center of the circle? Well, what's causing the force right now? Centripetal force is never on its own, right? It's always caused by something. Zach, what's causing the force? My hand. Where's my hand in this circle? Center of the circle. My hand is pulling the keys toward the center of the circle. Why don't the keys actually go toward the center of the circle? Why do they go in a circular path as opposed like this, as opposed to like this? Why does the Earth orbit the sun and not go directly in towards the sun? Why does a car going around a turn go in a turn as opposed to directly toward the center? Because it's move. Go ahead. Yes, good. It wants to move in a straight line. It's trying to move in a straight line. That's what nature wants it to do, is go off in a straight line. But because there's an unbalanced force toward the center of the circle, it doesn't go in a straight line. So where does it go? Really, it's somewhere in between a straight line and toward the center of the circle. Okay, there is a centripetal force. There is a centripetal acceleration. Even though it doesn't go toward the center, the force and the acceleration both are toward the center. Now, technically, the equation that describes acceleration that we learned on the first day of class, or the second or third day of class, is valid here, as is the equation for force, m times a. The problem with using either one of these is that the direction changes, and how do we quantify that if the direction changes? It's pretty tough. So what we're going to do is tend not to use these two equations, but rather we're going to use a, an equation that's specific to centripetal acceleration. A is equal to V squared over R. Now, what do those two vertical lines mean? Tell me what those two vertical lines mean. Yep. Yeah, those are the absolute value. This means that um, you can see that there's a little vector sign over A. It means that there is a vector nature associated with this acceleration. There's a direction. But if we have the absolute value signs there, then it means we can't get the direction from this equation. There is a direction, but the equation is not going to tell me what it is. Okay? Unlike this equation that we learned way back at the beginning of Physics 20, there's a direction, and the equation will tell me what the direction is. Listen, it's not such a big deal that this equation won't tell me what the direction is. It's not a big deal at all, because I know the direction before I even start the question. We know that it's always toward the center of the circle. So if there's ever a time when the equation won't tell me what the direction is, this is the time to have it. Because I already know what the direction is before I start the problem. Yep? OK. OK. OK, Nick. Uh, so Nick's question is, it's a good question. Uh, Nick's question is, what if you're decelerating? What if you're decelerating? Well, here's the thing, Nick. Um, when you talk about decelerating, I think you're probably meaning slowing down, right? Okay, so what if you're slowing down? Uh, the issue is this, Nick. We're talking about uniform circular motion. These equations are valid whenever we have a constant speed. So these equations actually don't work if the speed is changing, right? A is equal to V squared over R. It's assuming the same V all the way around the circle. Now, you can do an analysis of non-uniform circular motion, but it's more complicated than what we're doing here now. Okay, and you know what? For the most part, what we do is, is a pretty good approximation with what exists out there in the real world in a lot of different things. Okay, so we won't go there. Centripetal force. Well, force is equal to m times a. But a is v squared over r. So we can replace that with fc is equal to mv squared over r. The acceleration toward the center of the circle 
the force toward the center of the circle? What units would we use for acceleration? Don't make this harder than it has to be. You know the answer to this. Phil, what would it be? Yeah. It's velocity squared over distance or over radius or velocity over time, which means it's going to be meters per yeah, meters per second squared. Same units. What about for centripetal force? It's a force. It's m times a, m times centripetal acceleration. It's newtons. Good question, Michael. Michael's question is, in this equation, mv squared over r, should we say v squared over r and then multiply the whole thing by m? Or should we say m times v squared and then divide it by r? Who votes for the first way? m times v squared over r. Who votes for the second way? m v squared all divided by r. Who says doesn't matter? Sam? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So try it sometime. Try it. If you have a question involving this, try this and then divide it by r. Try this and then multiply it by m. It's the exact same thing. Sometimes, in fact, I usually write it like this, but sometimes I'll just kind of get a little careless and write it like this. It doesn't matter. It looks a little bit different, but it's the same answer. OK, have a look at an example on page 225, 255. A DVD, boy, this book isn't that old, like six or seven years old, and it's already obsolete, eh? Nobody watches DVDs anymore. A DVD has a diameter of 12 centimeters in a rotational period of 0.1 seconds. What's the centripetal acceleration at the outer edge of the disk? How quickly is the velocity changing at the outer edge of the disk? Not how quickly is the speed changing. Nick, remember, we said it's constant speed, right? Okay, how quickly is the velocity changing? How quickly is the direction changing? Okay, we got a diameter here of 12 centimeters. I want to convert that right away, actually, to radius. I'm going to get 0 0.0600 meters. I don't like meters, sorry, I don't like centimeters, and I don't like diameter. So let's get into meters and radius. What's that, 0.100? What's the point one zero zero time frequency? What is that? Yeah, right. it's the period. It's big T, right? The time that it takes for one complete revolution. So a DVD spins around ten times in one second. What's the acceleration at the outer edge of the disk? A the centripetal acceleration is the unknown. So we're going to say A is equal to V squared over R. And V, we don't know what V is, but we can find it. We did this the other day, right? Reviewed it here a minute ago. 2 times pi times 0 0.600 divided by the period of 0 0.100. I get a speed here of 37.699 meters per second. Is that right? Sorry, that should be 0 0.06. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Uh, 0 0.060, which makes it 3.7699, right? Seems a little bit better. 37 meters per second would be a little bit, seems a little bit fast for that. All right, there's the speed. Good. 3.7699 squared divided by 0 0.0600. gives us 236.9, or 237 meters per second squared. That's a big acceleration, right? In 25 days, you guys are going to be going on your big field trip to the amusement park. You're going to be given a data booklet for seven different assignments. You're going to have to complete the data collection for all seven assignments. And then when you come home, you're going to be given an analysis book where you're going to be given questions that you're going to use that data for in order to solve. This question will appear a number of times throughout the seven experiments. OK, 
calculate the g's, the g-force. Now, there's a couple ways that you can do that. One is to take the normal force and divide it by the force of gravity. That'll give you the number of g's. The other way is to take the acceleration and divide it by 9.81. If we do that in this case, we end up getting about 24. So a bug on the edge of this DVD that's stuck to the DVD somehow and isn't allowed to fly off, this bug would experience 24 Gs. This bug would feel, on the outer edge of this DVD, 24, thank you, 24 times heavier than he actually is. Okay, you will, at the amusement park, in a couple of different situations, feel approximately four times heavier than you really are. And you're going to notice that. You're going to feel really, really heavy in that situation. Okay, this is 24. Okay, this is enough. If you were the person on the other side there, that's enough to make you pass out. And if you're going to sustain it for any length of time at all, it's enough to probably make you die. 24 Gs. All right. With that pleasant news, let's have a look at three questions that go along with that on page 255 and see what you can do with those. Please. All right, let's take a look at number three. It says, a helicopter blade that has a diameter of 14 meters and a centripetal acceleration of 2,527 meters per second squared. Talk about the number of Gs, the number of G-forces, right? This would be about 25, 250 Gs. Something on the end of this helicopter blade would feel 250 times heavier than it really is. You can understand engineering issues with this now, right? This helicopter blade has to be incredibly strong. If the metal on the end of this helicopter blade weighs one kilogram, then it's going to have the apparent weight. It's going to feel 25 or 250 times heavier than that. So it's going to have the stress on the rest of the helicopter blade of 250 kilograms for every 25 kilo, sorry, for every uh, kilogram of, of real mass. So you can see how, again, engineering-wise, this has to be built to be able to hold that so the blade literally doesn't fall apart because of the extreme forces involved there. All right. We want to know the period of the helicopter blade, how long it takes to go around the circle one time. So let's give it a whirl here. We've got a diameter of 14 meters in the question number three. Let's make that a radius of 7.00 meters. We've got an acceleration of 2,527 meters per second squared. And we want to find big T. That's, that's all we got. The only equation that we have with big T in it is this one. V is equal to 2 pi r over T. It's valid, and it's the only one we have with big T in it. So let's use that. Let's rearrange it. T is equal to 2 pi r over V. Right, the V goes down, the T goes up. Let's plug in some numbers if we got it. 2 times pi times uh, 7.00 meters divided by the speed. Well, we don't know what the speed is. So we've got to find it somehow. And this is where a few people were disagreeing, right, on, on the value of the speed. So let's say A is equal to V squared over R. The R goes up by multiplying. The R goes up by, sorry, the, uh, that's not right. What the heck have I done there? What is that? Is anybody going to say something and say, like, like, you're from space? This is... This is, uh, where did the square come from there? Well, I took the square off the V. I've got a square R, right? Why would I? The R goes up by multiplying, and then i got to square root that to get V. So it becomes the square root of 2,527 times uh, 7.0. What does that work out to be? 133? Anybody else get that? Yes? Uh, is that exact, Nick? Yes? 133 meters per second. Hey, listen, the outside tip of this helicopter blade is going at almost one and a half football fields per second. That's over one third of the speed of sound. This thing is moving fast. Okay, 133 meters per second. Now we're going to take that value, plug it into here. And when we do, I think, if I remember right, we got 0 
Zero point three three. Okay, I'm thinking of another question. Zero point three three, and we should go to three digits, right? Zero point three three one means it takes for something that's fourteen meters long, it takes a third of a second to go all the way around once. Make sense? Now, those of you who are disagreeing on something with this, is it resolved? Is there an issue resolved, Jotham? Yeah. Were you right? Yeah. Okay. Kind of makes you feel good, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, let's take a look at let's take a look at another question here. This one says, and determine the magnitude of the centripetal force this time exerted by the rim of a dragster's wheel on a 4,500 kilogram tire. Tire is this radius, and it's rotating with this speed. So we're going to say M is 45.0 kilograms. We're going to say V is 30.0 meters per second, which, I mean, think about that. 30 meters per second, that's actually pretty slow for a dragster, right? That's like 110 kilometers per hour. It's normally going to be going faster than that. We got a radius here of 0 0.480 uh, meters. And we want to find the centripetal force. We're going to say that F is equal to mv squared over r. If we don't know what v is, then let's get it using 2 pi r over t. But we got it here. We got it this time. So let's plug our numbers in and see what we get. 45 times 30 squared divided by, look. Who was it that asked me whether it was Michael, I think it was, wasn't it? Okay. I just did this not on purpose, not to make a point. It's just one of those things that happened, right? I put the line all the way over under the 45. Okay. The equation says 45 times v squared over r. I've made it 45 times v squared over r. Does it matter? No. Okay, I didn't do that on purpose, but it doesn't matter that I did it. Let's do this on our calculator to make sure we can all get the right value. What do we end up getting here? 45 times, let's say 30 squared, divided by 0 0.480 gives me 84,375, which we're going to round to three digits, 8.44 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Talk about the engineering in a helicopter blade. You know, how, how strong this helicopter blade must be in order to spin around and not disintegrate into a million pieces because the amount of Gs experienced on the outside of the helicopter blades is about 250. 250 times heavier than it really is. Even this on a tire. Even the engineering involved in making a tire, designing a tire. Okay, the outside of this tire experiences a force of 84,000 newtons as it's going down the road at 30 meters per second. That's a lot of force. This tire has to be able to withstand 84,000 newtons, even if it's just going the speed limit. You remember, you buy tires, they're rated for a certain speed. You can buy tires that are rated for higher speeds and tires that aren't rated for, for higher speeds. Do you ever kind of think in the back of your mind, like, I wonder if there's really a difference? There is. You pay more for tires rated at a higher speed because they need to be stronger because they're going to experience more force. Right? That's why you shouldn't go too fast. Well, it's one of the reasons why you shouldn't go too fast on your stock tires is because the tires can't stand it. All right. Let's try... These two questions, please, that go along with that. Let's try one more example here now. 5.5 on 259. It says, determine the maximum speed at which a 1,500-kilogram car can round a curve that has a radius of 40 meters. Here's a static friction coefficient of static friction between the tires and the road. This is an engineering problem if I ever saw one, right? You're designing a highway. You've built the highway. And then you're trying to decide, hey, what should we make the speed limit? What do you do? Do you get a bunch of guys just going really, really fast around the turn and saying, eh, I think we should lower it? Or do you actually calculate what the speed limit should be? Let's calculate what the speed limit should be here. Okay, if we want to know, um, 
I'm sorry, we've got, we know the uh, mass of the car is 1,500 kilograms. Although, hey, cars can be different masses, right? Is this a, is this a safe assumption to make? Oh, maybe that's the average mass of a car. But what about if you're dealing with a smart car that's a lot lighter? Or a semi-truck that's a lot heavier? We'll see in a second. Okay, we'll see in a second. There's a radius on this highway of 40 meters. And there's a coefficient of friction of 0 0.60. What's the speed that you can travel? Now, we know that f is equal to mv squared over r. That's definitely valid here. The object's going in a circle. Centripetal force applies here. But we don't have enough information to use this. Okay, we're looking for v. Okay, great. We know what m is, we know what r is, but we also don't know what f is. Two unknowns in one equation. Not helpful. Let's do this. Let's set fc equal to ff. Why did I do that? Why is the centripetal force equal, the same value as the friction force? Remember what we said a little while ago? Centripetal force is not fundamental. Sam? No. It's moving at a constant speed, not velocity. It is accelerating toward the center of the circle. Centripetal force is caused by friction. If it's caused by friction, then it's equal to friction. Okay, if you don't have friction, this car isn't going in a circle. Let's say the centripetal force that's caused by friction is equal to the force of friction. Well, let's simplify this a little bit. Would you look at this? Normal force is m times g. Look, mass cancels. Hey, what did I ask you just a minute ago? The mass of the car? What do we know about the mass of the car now? Sorry? It do, yeah, it doesn't matter what the mass of the car is. So you're the engineer designing this highway. You're trying to determine what the speed limit should be. It doesn't matter how heavy the car is. The speed limit for every car going around that turn should be the same. You don't see speed limits on the highway for different cars, right? Small cars go this speed. Big cars go this speed. It's the same. If I take the r up by multiplying, v squared is equal to mu times g times r. v is equal to the square root of mu times g times r, which is the square root of 0 0.60 times 9.81 times 40. Square root that. It's actually rounding this to two digits. We should get 15 meters per second. You know, you're designing this highway. It might make sense actually to do it the other way around. Instead of building the highway and then calculating what the speed limit should be, maybe you set what, the, what you want the speed limit to be and then design how big the radius should be in response to that. Does that make sense? So you plan the highway around how fast you want to go as opposed to planning how fast you have to go around the highway. The reality is, it probably goes both ways sometimes. Sometimes it's, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Probably sometimes it's the highway, then let's see what the speed should be. Sometimes it's, let's design the highway around the speed. Let's try those three questions that go along with that. 